subject of the talk tonight is the role of government in a free society. And I think in discussing that subject, the first thing you have to do is to emphasize the very different meanings that free has. There are two quite different meanings of free which tend to get confused and which it's important to keep separate. The first is freedom in the sense of the absence of coercion. That's the sense in which I shall be trying to use the term. The second is free in the sense of free lunch, in the sense of absence of cost. The two meanings are very different and there are few sources, few more important sources of confusion about the proper role of government in our society than the confusion between the two very different meanings of the word free. The freedom that was suggested back in the days of World War II by Franklin Roosevelt when he spoke of the four freedoms and spoke of the freedom from want. How can you guarantee one person of freedom from want except by coercing another person to provide the material means for his being free from want. Freedom from want involves coercion. It may be a fine objective, but it uses the word freedom in an altogether different sense. Now obviously if men are going to live in a society there is no way in which you can have absolute freedom. There is a famous dictum of a Supreme Court Justice that my freedom to move my fist is limited by the proximity of your chin. In a society in which there are many people, freedoms are bound to interfere one with the other. We are bound to have limits. And the question that we need to ask, and the question that I want to talk about tonight, is what arrangements in a society will minimize coercion while preserving the maximum opportunity for members of a society to cooperate with one another to achieve their separate objectives. The fundamental principle that I am going to try to uphold was stated by John Stuart Mill in On Liberty over a hundred years ago. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. That's the fundamental principle that I am going to take as a given as describing my own values in trying to discuss the question of what government, government's role in a society dedicated to promoting freedom in that sense what its role is. From this point of view, the nation state is a means to an end, not an end in itself. This notion that the individual, or rather in our society, in every society, the family is the basic unit. That we have responsible individuals or families cooperating one with another to achieve their objectives is in very, very sharp contrast to the notion that the fundamental unit is the state, that you have a nation state, and that the individual serves, the individual exists to serve the state. The ideal is that you shall have joint action only insofar as people have been persuaded to act together. That you should have joint action only insofar as responsible individuals, after free and full discussion, have agreed jointly to cooperate in some venture. It's from this point of view that the market, voluntary exchange through buying and selling, is so important as a basis for a free society. The market has the enormous virtue 
that it enables you to achieve voluntary cooperation, to achieve unanimity without conformity. Everybody can do his own thing. Everybody can go to the store and buy what he wants to buy. However, there are some items where it is not feasible for everybody to do his own thing. There are some cases in which you must have uniformity. Some cases in which the answer must be the same for all the people. The most obvious example is in the case of national defense. There is no way in which some people in a country can be engaged in an international war and other people in a country can be not engaged in that war. The decision whether the country is at war is a yes or no decision that must be the same answer for all. Ideally, the ideal would be that we should not engage in such joint activities unless we have first achieved unanimity. But it is clear that that's not a feasible ideal. It is clear that you cannot, in a changing world, subject to problems that come up from time to time, that you cannot afford the time that would be required in order to get everybody jointly to agree on the same course of action. And hence, all of us who have lived in these kinds of societies, all societies of this kind have been led to adopt something short of unanimity, a majority rule as an expedient for reaching those kinds of decisions which require conformity. I, let me stress that the majority rule in that concept context is not a principle, it's an expedient. People generally are inclined to equate democracy with majority rule. I believe that is a great mistake. There is nobody who believes in majority rule as an absolute. There is nobody who believes that if 51% of the people should vote to shoot the other 49%, that that would make it okay. And our society in particular is, is erected on the notion that minorities have rights and not merely majorities. The Bill of Rights of our Constitution was an attempt to prescribe and assure in advance that majorities would not rule. And we are not willing to have a simple majority settles, settle everything. For some purposes, a simple majority will do. If it's more important to reach a decision than it is what decision to reach, fine, a majority will do. But if it's something fundamental, for example, a foreign treaty, our Constitution requires a two-thirds vote. If it's something even more fundamental, such as changing our basic Constitution, well then we provide that you must have much more than a simple majority. You must have a, a, a qualified majority of the various states as well as of the Congress. So majority rule is an expedient which we have adopted in those cases where we need conformity. Now the reason why this is important is because the use of the political channel for deciding issues, while it is absolutely inevitable, while you must do it, inevitably tends to strain the co social cohesion essential for a stable society. No society can be stable unless there is a basic, unthinking, unquestioning allegiance to certain common principles. If we are going to maintain a free society, especially in a society in which you have wide differences of customs and values and beliefs, it is essential that you rely as little as possible on the political mechanism and as much as possible on the market mechanism of voluntary cooperation where each group can go its own way.